Good evening. Yeah. Welcome to Can't See 2013. Woo. Who would have thought that on Halloween night, <laughs> on a rainy day, in, uh, on your campus, the suburban paradise that it is, uh, we would have had so many people come out uh, to hear a great talk of solutions, um, ecological economics. We're going to get a whole lot of it for the next uh, two and a half days. Um, and it's, it's because um, it, it, these are challenges that uh, we have in front of us. We have uh, an economic malaise and uh, large environmental problems that uh, no one seems to listen to. Uh, and the folks uh, in this discipline uh, have solutions and why we, sh we should be changing the economic system to something uh, where it should be going. And, and, and we are on a, a certain path that, that we should continue on. So, uh, briefly, I'm going to give you three things. Um, who is CANSI and what is uh, Canadian uh, or Ecological Economics? CANSI is uh, based on the uh, International Journal, uh, Ecological Economics is economics as if the world mattered, a whole earth uh, economics. Uh, I want to thank a few people. We're in the uh, Faculty of Environmental Studies, uh, a really great place to study environmental studies uh, and, and a, uh, a haven for research in this area. Um, uh, ecological economics has, has really, thanks to um, Ellie Perkins and Peter Victor and uh, the great students uh, in this faculty. Uh, they've gone on to do a whole lot of better things. Uh, I'll introduce myself, I apologize. My name is Andreas. I am the uh, CANSI Conference Chair and the VP Programs. Uh, and I uh, work for the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources in my day job. And uh, this is a volunteer gig for me. CANSI is a, a non-profit organization. Um, so all of this uh, two and a half days has been done in our spare time. Imagine uh, if we could do this full time. Um, uh, other, uh, other assistance, so uh, FES has helped us with um, having the conference here, but we also have a secretariat. We met with the dean. The dean will introduce uh, tomorrow morning opening plenary, uh, uh, where, um, uh, again, this, we hope that this is going to start a whole lot more research uh, in the faculty. Um, I want to uh, also thank the volunteers, uh, the executive, uh, and a number of the sponsors, uh, Ivy Foundation, um, Suzuki Foundation, uh, Green Analytics, uh, Broadbent Institute, um, uh, Social Sciences, Humanities, Research Council of Canada gave us funding. Um, I don't want to talk too much longer. Uh, <laughs> I, again, I, I, uh, I think we're going to get a great talk tonight. And uh, hopefully it will uh, engender a, a great dialogue. The intent of the conference, the theme was uh, sustaining the commons, ideas and actions for a green economy. Yeah, the intent for that was based on Eleanor Ostrom's uh, uh, Nobel Prize uh, winning economist uh, theory on um, governing the commons. And the idea is that collaboration and cooperation can, uh, can solve common resource problems. So climate change, uh, water pollution, uh, air pollution, the, the realm of environmental problems are because the environment are external to the economy and the way that the current paradigm governs uh, the way we do business, and that needs to change. So hopefully we can get some ideas from the scholars and actions from some of the practitioners uh, so that we can change to develop something different. Um, and uh, I think it hopefully should be quite inspiring. I'm going to leave it to... Um, uh, a PhD student, uh, Brett Dolter, who's been a uh, key program coordinator with the CANSI conference to introduce uh, Bill Reese. Uh, so again, thanks very much. Oh, I have a, a number of things. Uh, sorry, one more thing. Uh, 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 logistics. Social media. Uh, hashtag Green Economy. Uh, we also have a Twitter at uh, CANSI underscore conf. So join the Twitter account. <coughs> Now, those students that are here, we have travel expense forms. Washrooms are, there's a, there's a, uh, there's one, uh, a smaller washroom there. There's, there's two right by the elevators. There's another set of washrooms on the second floor. Uh, bring your name tag each day. Helps conversation. Uh, program, same thing. Uh, <coughs> coffee mugs. Um, 
There's a shuttle. Uh, for those who are at the hotel, uh, nearby hotel, uh, it will be leaving, I believe, at 9, but uh, make sure to let us know and the volunteers know, uh, because we'll make sure that they, they don't leave without you. Um, and uh, I believe that's it for now. So I'll turn that over to Brett. But thanks again for coming on, uh, on this night, Halloween night. Good evening. As Andre said, I'm Brett Tolter. I'm a student here at York. Uh, midway through my PhD, I, I hope midway through. Um, and it's, it is with great pleasure that I introduce our plenary speaker this evening, Dr. William E. Rees. Uh, as, you, as you may have known, as you've probably seen on the uh, advertisements for the conference, Professor Rees is most well known for being the co-creator of the ecological footprint concept. Uh, and as he's told the story before, a, a computer tech at UBC was in his office sizing up his desk to see if his computer would fit, and they were talking about the footprint of the computer on his desk. And I think Bill's brain went off there and thought, that'd be a great name for this land area measure of our environmental impact. Uh, so footprint came to be, and the word is now, I'd say, a part of our culture. It's a, it's a meme that we see throughout, throughout our, our country and throughout the world. Uh, we talk about countries' ecological footprints, or its carbon footprint. There's some research who are now calculating our slavery footprint. So, so Bill's, Bill's work has really inspired a lot of people in that way. Uh, it's, it's made the impacts of our consumption visible. Uh, I met Professor Rees, or Bill as his students call him, about a decade ago when I was just starting a degree in environmental studies uh, at UBC. Uh, and my first experience with Bill, he was teaching a, a course called the Ecological Context of Planning. Uh, and the first thing he did, he got into the room, the first thing he did was ask the class, how do we know? How do we know anything at all? How do we know we're not currently surrounded by ultraviolet banshees screaming at supersonic pitch? Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we might not know, and we have to think about the way we see the world. And at that moment, I thought to myself, well, this is what university is supposed to be. Uh, this is the first time I've ever thought that in a university, so thanks, Bill, for that inspiring uh, experience. And I know that hundreds of others have had the opportunity to learn from Bill. If you're in Vancouver and you talk to any of the planners who are really passionate about sustainability, there's a very good chance that they've taken the courses from Bill. Uh, his, his influence has, has gone beyond the footprint concept to, uh, to be an influence on people's lives who are still making a difference today. So, I know that Bill is not retired from teaching at UBC. Uh, he's kept busy. Uh, you might find him on Granville Islands, uh, hawking the soap he makes at home. He's now a soap maker in his spare time. Uh, but it's good that we've got him here tonight. We can learn from Bill uh, one more time and have, have an opportunity to, to hear what he's got to say this evening. So, please join me in welcoming Professor William E. Reeves. I'm astonished that on Halloween, so many bright-eyed Toronto-Bonians would show up for a meeting like this to hear something like this. So, uh, thank you very much for being here. I thank uh, the organizers for inviting me. I apologize for my raspy voice. I have a bad cold. <clears throat> I'm at the tail end of it, so I may collapse somewhere halfway through this before some of you. <clears throat> I've got 37 slides. I can spend an hour and a half on each, so we're programmed to book for 50 hours, I think. <laughs> we'll have a couple of bathroom breaks along the way. Okay, look, I'm taking a bit of a flyer here tonight. Uh, we're at a conference on ecological economics. Uh, I've been associated with that concept, the discipline, if it is a discipline, for as long as it's existed. And certainly, as this case in Canada, I was one of the co-founders of the society. I've had a long and, I think, by most standards, reasonably successful academic career. I've been on many committees that had to do with the areas of my alleged expertise. And throughout all of that, I acquired over time an increasing sense of futility. Uh, the fact of the matter is that almost everything I'm interested in, almost everything that we measure in our ongoing studies on the human ecological footprint, are increasingly darker, uh, despite our massive accumulation of scientific knowledge, uh, better and better modeling, and so on and so forth. And Andrea said it at the outset, that hasn't made a whole hell of a lot of difference in the overall trends 
in which society is going. So what I've been doing recently is trying to figure out well, what, what is that all about? And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about tonight. I'm going to explore just one avenue in which this kind of question has taken me. There are several others. I could have chosen any one of them. But I find this one of, of particular interest. So bear with me. It's a kind of a personal exploration of the big question. Why has my life made no goddamn difference at all? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So just to set up the context. This is us. Uh, 2013, we're over 1 point, or 7.1 billion people on the planet. It's barely begun to level out, as I've indicated with the slant on that arrow. But the real lesson to take from this graph, this is 2,000 years of human history. And if we were really serious about human population studies, we'd take it back another 200,000 years. That's roughly the lifespan of the genus Homo, or at least by some interpretations. And what you would learn by that is that it's entirely flat for 99.999% of that entire period. How many of you have heard of economic <coughs> growth? Could you repeat that, please? <laughs> How many of you have heard of economic growth? <laughs> so, even this is enough to show us that the phenomenon of growth, look, there were periods of growth in here, but always fluctuating. Fluctuating with local characteristics. <coughs> Populations got knocked back by plague and so on and so forth. But no trend over the long term. Most of the growth of human numbers up until about 1400 were the spreading of the human population over the face of the earth. But in any particular locale, fluctuating populations as the local <coughs> carrying capacity changed. So what this graph really shows us is that only seven or eight generations of human beings have experienced that growth in their lifetimes to even notice it. And the same, by the way, can be said about technological development. If you go back eight generations, if you live to be 90 years old, the technologies in play at the end of your life would be exactly the same ones for all intents and purposes as those in play at the beginning of it. So we tend to think of, and if you pick up any issue of any newspaper on the planet anywhere, it's all about growth and restarting the economy and moving and, that, and so on and so forth. We take growth to be the norm when in fact we are one of those few generations that have ever experienced it out of thousands of generations. And we live in the single most anomalous <coughs> or abnormal period in the history of our species. And the whole thing has been made possible, I think, by the singular event of discovering how to use abundant cheap energy in the form of fossil fuel. So this explosion of human numbers, and by the way, it's fractional in its impact compared to the explosion of consumption. Per capita consumption is rising vastly more rapidly than is human population right now. So this whole explosion of the human enterprise, numerically in terms of our population, and in terms of the quantity of energy and material consumed to sustain this is an anomalous period, unprecedented, and cannot continue in the absence of abundant, cheap energy. And so far, we haven't any substitutes for a fossil fuel. <coughs> the store keeps opening and clunking me in the knees. It is Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And as, as I say, not just people, this is a series of graphs just showing that everything else is growing in lockstep. Uh, consumption is increasing super exponentially because the rate of consumption is increasing uh, regularly. The upshot of all this, and this is what much of my work has been engaged with, with many of my, my students, is in calculating the human ecological footprint, simply defined as the area of productive ecosystems required by any specified population to produce the ecologically uh, product, uh, the, bio the biologically produced goods and services, food and fiber, and to assimilate the waste, particularly the carbon wastes. And we now have a method that is so well refined that if you just gave me your annual shopping list, we could give you your personal ecological footprint with a fair degree of accuracy. The bottom line is this, the world is in a state of overshoot. 
There are, and anybody can do this number, just go to the university library and pull out all the resource atlases, about 12 billion hectares of productive land and water on the planet. The rest is rock, ice, or relative desert. There are some 7.1 billion people on the planet. Our average eco footprint is therefore on the order of 2.7 hectares. But there's only 1.8 hectares per person on the entire surface of the Earth. So the total human footprint is something like 19 billion hectares, 50% roughly speaking more than is available. So the question is, how do we continue to live and grow? And the answer is, by liquidating our natural capital assets, by destroying the soils, by overfishing, massive land degradation, by filling the waste sinks to overflowing. Climate change is a waste management problem. Carbon dioxide, one of the principal drivers, is the single largest waste by weight of Western industrial economies. We don't tend to think of it that way, but that's really what it is. And it's a very large component, the carbon sink function of the eco footprint. We're at the point where arguably Herman Daly's nightmare has come true. Now this is a graph that simply shows the relationship at the margin between the costs and the benefits of growth. <coughs> and he would argue that yes, we're continuing to grow, and of course there are benefits as we grow. We're still having positive gains. But the more we grow, the more the costs mount in terms of depleted assets, in terms of health costs, in terms of a whole variety of things that go unmeasured because we don't run very good at measuring costs. In theory then, a point is reached at which the costs of growth, think of climate change, the multi-billion dollars of damage that result from a typical large storm these days, in excess of what would have happened prior to that, event, and so on. If we were to add all of that up together, we may well find that every increment of growth is now producing more costs than benefits. The problem is, of course, that the benefits are going to a relatively few who are already are wealthy and don't need them, and the costs are being distributed widely, uh, particularly being borne by people elsewhere and uh, poor who can't very well defend themselves. Any growth beyond this point results in negative gains. So it's uneconomic growth. We talk about economic growth as if it's a good thing. Uneconomic growth means growth that costs us more than it's worth. Okay? Now, that's the state of the world today, and it's getting worse. Uh, carbon emissions are accelerating, the growth is accelerating, and next year we anticipate 3 to 4% growth in, uh, globally, uh, which will almost invariably mean an increase at least 2 to 3% in terms of material throughput, certainly a, a large <clears throat> increase in carbon dioxide, and so on and so forth. So here we are, a species with these potentials. There are many, many qualities that distinguish humans from non-human species. But I think these five are particularly important in the context we're discussing. In theory, we are an intelligent species. <laughs> We pride ourselves on being evidence of intelligence. What's that? Not empirically. <laughs> well, that's the whole point of this exercise this evening. But in theory, we have unparalleled capacity for evidence-based reasoning and logical analysis. That's what I call high intelligence. No other species comes close to human beings in the ability to express this quality. No species has the ability to plan ahead. <coughs> I taught in a planning school for 43 years on the premise that we can use data and analyses to change the future to our benefit. No other species can do that. We have the capacity to exercise moral judgment. No other species can do that. We have a unique diversity of mechanisms for cooperative engagement in the problems that plague us all. Now, other species cooperate to a degree, but certainly human beings are orders of magnitude beyond any other species in our capacity to get together to solve problems that are of interest to us. We also have another unique quality. Well, no, it's not unique. Elephants and walruses and a few other species show a degree of this. And the ability to be compassionate 
empathetic with the fates of other individuals and even other species. I know people who weep every time they read the statistics on uh, current rates of species extinction and hear about the demise of some other favorite uh, charismatic species. In your lifetimes, you will see in the next decade the loss of bluefin tuna. You will see over the next 20 years the extinction of tigers in the wild. <clears throat> These are inevitabilities given the current trajectories that we're all planning to accelerate. So these qualities are out there. They are qualities of each and every one of us. There are many, many others, but I think these are particularly important. Now, if we were to apply all of those qualities, we might come up with a solution, planned degrowth. And guess what? John Stuart Mill got there first. As far as I'm aware, this was the first reference to the idea that maybe we ought to stabilize. And this is, what, 1848, 160 odd years ago? 160 years ago, Mills argued that, you know, people don't really need to get much richer. What we need instead in already wealthy countries is a system for redistribution of wealth so that there isn't extremes of wealth and poverty within the country. This is his version of what we would call today contraction and convergence. Quote, it is only in the backward countries of the world that increased production is still an important object. In those most advanced countries, what is economically needed is better distribution. Now keep in mind that this is in a period when the wealthiest people probably didn't come close to the average North American in terms of the quality and quantity of their personal possessions. So this is an astounding insight on his part. <clears throat> he also effectively talked about a society of enoughness in which people would have sufficient leisure, both physical and mental, from mechanical details to cultivate the graces of life. Here was a man in 1848 talking about the necessary shift in already wealthy countries, pale, they'd be impoverished by our standards today, but nevertheless talking about the need to begin to focus on qualitative betterment rather than quantitative gain. Astonishing. So we move ahead a century or so, and, uh, oh, I should have pointed this out, forgot I kept this one. Mill even made the ecological connection. This, when the world was essentially empty, and there was no such thing as major environmental problems, okay? He lamented that the earth might lose the great portion of its pleasantness, which it owes to things the unlimited increase of wealth and population would extirpate from it, for the mere purpose of enabling it to support a larger, but not a better or a happier population. <coughs> this could have been written by uh, Wilkinson and Pickett for their little book, The Spirit Level. If you haven't read that, you really ought to, because it's simply putting in uh, quantitative terms uh, with an analysis of most of the world's uh, advanced countries, exactly what Mill was talking about here. He found no satisfaction in contemplating a world with nothing left to the spontaneous activity of nature. And here's the kicker. He hoped for posterity's sake, the sake rather, that people would come to be content to be stationary long before necessity compels them to it. In other words, he feared that if the Earth or the human enterprise, even at that time, maintained its trajectory, the point would come when we'd be forced to stop, to slow down. And of course, a hundred and odd years later, we're reinventing those same ideas. Steady state economics is being advanced by us, ecological economists, as the basis for living more equitably within the means of nature. This is Herman Daly, one of the great fathers, I suppose, of ecological economics, his major legacy, although rooted in the theories of his own uh, thesis supervisor, Nicholas Georgeski Rogan, and their interpretation of the second law of thermodynamics, which basically says all economic activity is dissipative and vastly more destructive than constructive. The amount of material that has to be processed and destroyed to produce this computer keyboard would more than fill the space in which I'm standing here. So, humans don't produce anything. In thermodynamic terms, we are the great consumers of the rest of the Earth. We convert a small portion of that which we conserve, conserve consume into utility. 
The second and perhaps more recent movement is the European, largely, but it's now migrated to North America, the degrowth or decroissance movement. Again, advocating a gradual downscaling, this even goes beyond mere steady state, of production and consumption toward, again, a more equitable and cooperative society that would ensure both ecological stability and human well-being. Well, that's just an echo of what John Stuart Mill was telling us in 1848. <clears throat> so despite the increasing urgency and the fact that there's now real reasons for thinking this way, we have to ask whether we've even progressed very much beyond Mill's thinking. And we have to ask whether any of this, these ideas, which are now a century and a half old at least, are gaining any traction where it counts in mainstream society and culture. Okay. Which brings me to uh, really the central focus of what I want to talk about tonight, the nature of reality. It goes right back to the question that uh, Brett talked about at the outset. I taught a course for some years on the role of ecology in, in planning. And the first thing I had to, had to do in that course was to disabuse my students that they knew anything at all. In other words, I wanted to, in a sense, create a, a field in which I could plant new seeds without all of the superfluous, frankly useless knowledge that they had acquired in the course of their heretofore university educations. The bottom line here is that we are involved, even here this evening, in something that sociologists call. How many of you have heard of the social construction of reality? That's good. Good number of you. It's not really the construction of reality. It's the construction of our perceptions of reality. Every religious doctrine, every political ideology, every scientific theory, every academic paradigm, every mythic worldview, every social norm and cultural narrative is a social construct. We make reality up as we go. Each of these constructs, every concept, is first burst in language. Something cannot exist in the human domain unless we've given it form in language. Civil rights doesn't exist anywhere in nature. And if I'd said that a hundred years ago, it's an empty term. No one would have had a clue what I was talking about. But because we've had some decades now of discussion and discourse and dialogue and massaging of the concept, if I say civil rights, you all have a set of mental imagery that goes along with that particular concept. It is an emergent concept of the social construction by these processes of our particular culture. Even science is the social construction of reality. Now, there may be some differences, different kinds of constructs. Civil rights don't exist in the real world. Gravity does. Nevertheless, the law pertaining to gravity is a social construct. It's a model, a mathematical description of a physical entity that actually exists in the real world. So we have a whole spectrum of phenomena that are part of our intellectual apparatus. All are social constructs. Some don't have any counterpart in the real biophysical world, and some do. And very frequently, we get a bit confused. Extreme relativists suggest that because uh, everything is just a social construct, any idea is any, as good as any other. Well, I've got news for you. That's a very dangerous notion. Would you get on an airplane that was designed by someone who was told as a matter of <coughs> economics, look, in designing this plane, just ignore the laws of friction and gravity. Say somebody. <laughs> no. So the design of an aircraft has got to incorporate these models of real phenomena in the world so that the plane will function. It has to have an, an internal model of some aspect of the biophysical reality with, with, it, with which it interacts in order to function as an aircraft. So the point is then that social constructs are universal. You can't get away from them. All knowledge is a social construct. Uh, some of it's useful, some of it is not. Any particular construct is elevated to the status of received wisdom by tacit agreement 
among members of the social group creating the construct. So if you're an economist from the University of Chicago, you know exactly what the economy is all about. Because we have an agreed upon model of what the economy is all about that was created and massaged into reality by the practice of that particular school of economics. So both neoliberal and economic, uh, ecological economics are competing social constructs. But the question we really have to ask of any social construct is, is it valid? And here's where I think it becomes very important to understand uh, <clears throat> that not all constructs are even about the same thing are created equally. It is simply not the case that your view of the world is as good as mine, or my view of something is as good as yours. <coughs> Neil Postman has a wonderful little book called Building a Bridge to the 18th Century. Chapter 2 deals with the problem of extreme relativism, and these quotes are taken from it. You may say if you wish, and I've just spent 15 minutes pointing out that all a reality is a social construct, at least our perceptions are social constructs. However, you cannot deny that some constructions are truer than others. Remember my airplane. An aircraft designed with the best knowledge of physics in mind is a better map to the biophysical reality with which it interacts than is an aircraft that was designed in ignorance of all of that peripheral. So some conceptual models provide better maps of the reality they purport to resent, uh, represent than do others, particularly where there is a reality. Keep in mind, some social constructs have none of their nature. <coughs> Karl Popper, in his classic The Problem of Induction, makes exactly the same point. Both scientists and lunatics can postulate about anything they like. And what their theories have in common is that they're both conjectures. But some conjectures are much better than others. And science proceeds, at least good science, by explicitly testing its conjectures against that dimension of reality or those dimensions of reality that it purports to represent. That's what the experimental method is all about. And when reality feeds back on the model and tells us that it's incorrect, what do we do? As good scientists, we change our model. We revise our theorems. We test an alternative hypothesis. And bit by bit, progressively, in this way, we come to a better understanding, we hope, of the biophysical reality about which our science is supposedly proceeding. So we know all of this stuff, at least at one level, at least some of us think we do. But it has never stopped societies from buying into deeply flawed conjectures. We will buy into a deeply flawed conjecture if it makes us feel good, if it benefits us in the short term. You can think of a wide variety of your own reasons. And again, there's nothing new about this. You can all download for free a classic volume called The Crowd, A Study of the Popular Mind by Gustave Le Bon. The Crowd, A Study of the Popular Mind. It's in the public domain. Recommended reading. It's full of tasty little tidbits like this. The masses have never thirsted after truth. They turn aside from evidence that is not to their taste, preferring to deify error. Think about the world today. Think of Canada's economic development policy, rooted firmly in oil and gas and coal development and export. Not a mention of its possible contribution to climate change. We have become one of the world's great exporters of <coughs> climate change. We don't talk about it. Or if we do, it's to deny that it's a problem. Because, to leap ahead a century or so, Derek Jensen, just a pop philosopher in the United States, but a reasonable writer sometimes, off the wall on other occasions. But this is good. For us to maintain our way of living, we must tell lies to each other, and especially to ourselves. These lies are necessary because without them, deplorable acts would become impossibilities. In order to have slavery, you have to tell lies to yourself 
about the superiority of the slave owner over the slave. And I could repeat hundreds of examples. You can make these up as you go. The point of the matter is that we get by much of the time by papering over reality in order to continue to do exactly what the hell we want to do because it's in our best short-term interest to do so. Even hard science is afflicted by this. Um, if you read Thomas Kuhn's classic, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, he pointed out that often superior theories cannot dislodge the received wisdom because of resistance from the entrenched priesthood in whatever discipline we may be talking about. Think about economics <laughs> in this context. But Kuhn was preceded by Planck back in the 40s, German physicist. The new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die. And the new generation grows up familiar with the new concept. That's how human beings make progress. <laughs> and again, it's not as if this is a secret. Barbara Tuchman is an award, a Pulitzer Prize winning American historian. I believe, in fact, this was a book uh, that she won that prize for. The March of Folly, by the way, there's another little bow in there. Not truth, but error has always been the chief factor in the evolution of nations. Well, Tuchman took that up and wrote a book. 2,000 years of history, making the case that folly, or what she calls wooden-headedness, the march of folly, or wooden-headedness, is what really prevails in the political domain. Not wisdom, not science, not analysis, not data. Wooden-headedness is the source of self-deception. It plays a remarkably large role in government. By the way, while I'm reading this, think the Canadian Senate right now. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on there? It consists in assessing a situation in terms of preconceived fixed notions, ideology, religious doctrine, academic paradigm, while ignoring any contrary signs. Canadian Economic Development Policy, British Columbia's entire economic platform now is based on the, the insane notion of exporting liquefied natural gas. We don't even have the... Uh, <laughs> okay. It is acting according to wish, while not allowing oneself to be deflected by the facts. 1984. And she looks at this paradox, as it were, from Troy to the Vietnamese War. As a universal quality of human governance. Think about it. Remember all those wonderful qualities I talked about human beings being possessed of? Well, here's another. Endemic, chronic, and near absolute wooden-headedness in positions of power. And now, to my astonishment, this, I love this stuff because it's, trying, it's explaining to me what went wrong with my entire career. We're now seeing the emergence of, of a neuroscience, cognitive biology, cognitive neuroscience, evolutionary psychology, all of them are coming to very much the same kinds of conclusions about the way the human brain functions and processes information. One of the things most of them don't do is what I'll give you a hit about in a moment. This is sound evolutionary biology. And what, how many of you play a musical instrument? Just to be an oboe player. How many of you play a musical instrument? Is the question. When you look at a note on the page, do you have to say, hmm, that means raise this finger, lower that one, push on it, and, and, and so on and so forth? Oh, it just rolls off automatically. And it does so because you practice for 10,000 hours. And those hours and hours and hours of practice, athletes do the same thing. Create neural networks. Networks of synaptic circuits that fire instantly upon the stimulus of seeing the note on a page in a particular location on the musical staff. You don't have to think about it. It's automatic. Now it turns out that a form of that sort of thing takes place in general. 
in the course of the development <coughs> of the individual between the ages of yeah, very young and say 25 or 30. The brain is developing through that entire period. And what cognitive biology is telling us is that if through that period you have constant and frequent exposure to ideas, they, just like those musical notes, acquire a physical presence in the brain. The ideology becomes ingrained imprinted in the brain in the form of synaptic circuits. And when we put the appropriate equipment on your head, we can now titillate just one dimension of that very complex set of ideas, say capitalism, and the entire circuit associated with that phenomenon goes off. And by the way, if it's something that you've learned and, and are allegiant to, your body is flooded with pleasant hormones to reinforce that idea. If you encounter something entirely hostile to your pre-established way of thinking about reality, the opposite happens. Unpleasant hormones are released. The brain is part of the endocrine system, as well as the nervous system. So we have a built-in mechanism that causes us to seek out compatible experiences with those which we are already familiar with and aware of. How many of you are rabid businessmen out there plundering the planet? How many of you would call yourselves inclined toward uh, environmental thinking and ecological economics? So we have gathered together to reinforce each other's socially constructed views of the world. And across, I, I'm at the Skewlitz Business Center, that's where my hotel room is. I can feel a very different vibe going on in the conference <laughs> down the hall. Because there's another group of people who have come together to reinforce their particular paradigmatic views of the nature of reality. The bottom line, and again, wonderful books on this now, here's one called, uh, the, uh, it's called Brain and Culture by Bruce Wexler. This is a quote from Brain and Culture. Basically, he demonstrates that this is the case, and then he said, once these neural networks, these synaptic circuits that contain and, and, and imprint a particular pattern way of thinking exist, people seek out compatible experiences. And when faced with information that does not agree with their preformed internal structures, they deny, discredit, reinterpret, or forget that information. Stimulated to do so, by the way, by the release of unpleasant hormones, a sense of confusion, and well, I got to get out of here, get back into that room full of people that think the way I do. Now, this is the nature of human nature, and this, by the way, has strong evolutionary advantage. Imagine 10,000 years ago being born into a tribe that's prospering. If that tribe is prospering, practically surviving, it must be doing something right. So for a young developing individual, in the course of his ontological development, acquires the mores, the customs, the beliefs, and the mythology that have contributed to the survival, the success of that tribe, that individual is more likely to survive than somebody who is off the deep end and tries to do something entirely different. Behavioral conservatism has a real advantage in a relatively stable environment. And hence, there was selection process, or selection pressure on the human nervous system to acquire the habits of the tribe, the culture. And we can see this all around us. Look what goes on in the world today. Most of the major conflicts are between battling conceptual paradigmatic frames, whether it's you know, religious fundamentalism of the Christian kind in the U.S., or Islam, and Judaism, and so on and so forth. People kill themselves over the power of these paradigmatic expressions. But this is not trivial. This is the way we are. It's tribal in its essence. Today, the world is changing extremely rapidly. Climate change is accelerating. Extinctions are a daily occurrence. Food prices fluctuate, only they're steadily kicking upwards. We should now be very nimble in our capacity to respond to these things. 
Survival today depends not on the allegiance to an outmoded way of thinking, a paradigmatic framework that worked, you know, when times were stable and easy. Today, we need to be able to respond rapidly to the rapidly changing circumstances of our environment. And yet, we're the same species, the same people who evolved a natural behavioral conservatism in the context of a relatively stable environment. Remember that individual who grew up just seven or eight hundred years ago. Feel it to be 90. The technologies in place at the time of your birth would be the same technologies when you died. Nothing much changed. Better to adopt the qualities and characteristics of your culture. Well, why is all of this relevant? And the proposal I want to put forward to you today is that the conservative right in North America, particularly the United States, but certainly also in Canada, has beat the hell out of the liberal left in the game of social construction. And it's not an accident. They've done it purposefully, intentionally, and on a game plan that extends back now 40 years. So when I grew up, <clears throat> we used to fight elections in this country based on whether or not a particular policy was in the public interest. We talked about the public good. Government was seen to be a tool operating on behalf of ordinary people. Taxes, I, was, I, I wasn't even in an economics program, but I understood from the buzz in my community that taxation was a good thing. That's the way people pool their resources to achieve common purpose, to achieve social purposes in which they all have an interest, such as a decent public school system, such as health care, which people couldn't necessarily afford on their own. Today, the dialogue has shifted entirely. And we don't any longer think of taxes as a good thing. They're an unnecessary burden that inhibits people's creative imagination and individual entrepreneurial activity. Well, it's not by accident that that shift is taking place. So I invite you, by the way, all of this whole presentation is freely available to anybody, so you don't have to rapidly try to write down all of this stuff. In 1971, Lewis Powell, a corporate lawyer. How many of you have heard of the Powell Memorandum? Okay. One person, maybe two. Do yourself a service. Look up the Powell Memorandum. Powell, as a corporate lawyer, was very concerned that the values, beliefs, and assumptions of corporate capitalism in the United States were increasingly under attack from the environmental movement, which was birthed in the 1960s, from women's rights, from, I said it earlier, the civil rights movement, and so on. In fact, any cause that we might think of as you know, vaguely lefty, oriented towards society at large, was perceived as a major threat to the stability of the United States, and particularly the corporate sector of the United States. So Powell wrote this lengthy memo, which you can now download from a half a dozen sites. There's a huge volume of stuff out there about this. But I'd suggest you read at least two things that accompany the Powell memo. And that's uh, Lewis Lapham, a, a former editor of Harper's Magazine's little uh, study, The Tentacles of Rage, the Republican Propaganda Mill, from September 2004. Again, it's all available online. In addition, Bill Moyers has had a number of uh, programs and uh, essays responding to what Lewis Powell's memo achieved, and I've given you a couple of uh, references here. So again, please just look this up. You don't have to take what I'm about to tell you as me making stuff up. It's all there for you to see. What Powell recommended was that the corporate America come together to counter this emerging environmentalism, feminism, civil rights, and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> he recommended, among other things, that they fund seats in economics departments to make sure people weren't <coughs> confused by the alternative versions of economics that were starting to emerge. 
He recommended <coughs> that whole departments that were teaching the right thing, think Chicago School, be funded by the corporate sector. <coughs> he advocated the establishment of think tanks designed to resemble research institutions be set up to create literature that countered science, that denied climate, and so on and so forth. A colleague of mine at uh, Pittsburgh University has identified no fewer than 750 think tanks or similar organizations, large and small, around the United States, set up since 1970, at least partially uh, caught up in the response uh, to the Powell memo. So Powell asserted that the American economic system is under broad attack. <clears throat> I'm just quoting a couple of things here to give you an idea of the flavor. Business must learn the lesson that political power is necessary, that such power must be assiduously cultivated, and when necessary, it must be used aggressively and with determination, without embarrassment and without reluctance, which has been so characteristic of the business class to date. Strength lies in organization, in careful long-range planning and implementation, in consistency of action over an indefinite period of years, in the scale of financing available, only through joint effort they can cooperate in this sense, can't they? The latter well, idea was to include the financing of neoliberal economics departments establishing new things and other kinds of so-called front groups. The effect was if not immediate, certainly a long lasting, the number of corporations with public affairs offices in Washington grew from only 100 in 1968 to 500 in 1978. In 71, there were only 175 firms with registered lobbyists. A decade later, there were 2,500 of them. Agency capture and the revolving door syndrome became commonplace. By this, I mean. Uh, unholy alliance between regulators and regulatees. So, for example, uh, one of the chief regulators of the Food and Drug Administration is a former corporate lawyer for the Monsanto Corporation, who was therefore helpful in getting through the Mon Monsanto Exemption Act, which uh, frees Monsanto from any uh, prosecution by the U.S. government should it kill a bunch of people with bad GMO. I, mean, oh, I shouldn't have said that. It makes me sound flaky. Okay, the point of the matter is then that we see increasingly movement of people between regulatory agencies and the a, uh, corporate sector that they're supposed to be regulating, they become indistinguishable. I'm told that in Washington, the finance sector alone has five lobbyists, people, for every congressman, every congressman and senator. So we wonder why the financial sector was dismantled in the course of a few years, and it's largely because of that kind of activity. The number of corporate-run uh, political action committees increased from under 376 to 1,200 by the middle of 1980. Some of the entities that were explicitly set up in res response to the Powell Memo include the Business Roundtable, the American Legislative Exchange Council. If anyone wants to do an incredible PhD, look into the actions of Alec. This is an amazing organization. The Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, the Manhattan Institute, Citizens for a Sound Economy, and so on, and so on, and so forth. All organizations explicitly designed to push back against any idea of political equality, shared prosperity, and science that would inhibit the activities of the corporate sector in any way. Um, these are much too dense to, to go through. You're, you're beginning to get my idea. There's a couple of really important things here. This is from Lapham. Uh, the third point, all government is bad. This is what they were attempting to show. And this is the rhetoric I was talking about a moment ago. The word public, we don't hear anymore. In all its uses and declensions, public service, citizenship, public health, community, public park, commonwealth, public school, etc., is said to connote inefficiency and waste. By the way, remember we used to talk about the public. Now what are we? The C word? Consumers. You don't hear members of the public. We're consumers. That's our delegated role in the economic paradigm that, that, uh, that we've developed. Just one example. I'm sure everyone has heard of the Koch brothers. If you haven't, just look them up. I make the stuff not. I'm not making it up. I'm saying. The Koch brothers are heavily invested in coal, oil, 
uh, natural gas and a variety of industries associated with heavy industry and chemicals in the United States. <coughs> Up until 2011, there's a dozen studies of this kind. The Center for American Progress Action Fund identified at least $85 million that the Koch brothers had given to 85 right-wing think tanks and advocacy groups in a decade and a half up until 2011. Greenpeace claims that from 97 to 2011, the Koch brothers alone funneled $67 million to climate denial think tanks and other front groups. So organizations such as the Heartland Institute in Chicago, which is a leading organization creating climate denial in the United States, uh, all of these, of course, are working lockstep with the Koch's ideological agenda while presenting themselves as scientifically credible experts. They don't do science. They do counter-science. So what I'm arguing is <laughs> that subtly, unconsciously, and unknowing we, not you folks, but everybody you know, <laughs> are among the most successfully socially engineered generations of human beings ever to walk the planet Earth. We have seen a program in place, funded in tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, designed to wipe the scientific slate clean, even evolution is in decline, belief in, in the United States. Climate denial runs rife, although the story keeps changing. Right? It used to be there's no such thing as climate change, and oh yeah, there is, and we probably cause it. Well, we can't do anything about it, so let's just carry on. So it shifts in its meaning, but it still has the same effect, a paralysis in terms of doing anything that would be remotely corrected. So again, look at this. This is a cartoonist, I guarantee, who has never heard of Bruce Wexler. But people line up for the reassuring lie in avoidance of the inconvenient truth. People seek out compatible experiences and face with information that does not agree with their preformed internal structures. They deny, discredit, or reinterpret that information. Neocon values and ideology override evidence, analysis, and reason. Politicians, think Canada, show willful ignorance, <coughs> blindness to scientific data and analysis. We remain in a state of deep denial. Not only are we in a state of deep denial, we don't want anybody else to know either, so what do we do? We muzzle the scientific establishment in Ottawa. Where government scientists aren't allowed to speak to members of the public or the press without having their words first censored by the PMO or some other agency of government. Governments reject planning in the public interest. Instead, we put our faith in what are frankly rigged markets, rigged in favor of the corporate sector. Okay? We allow those rigged markets to determine major policy decisions. I can show you a dozen statements by Harper. Oh, no, it's not up to us to decide where Canadian oil is sold. The market will determine that. Oh, it's not up to us to decide which pipeline will serve whatever. It's not up to us to decide how it should be shipped or where it should go. The market will determine that. Well, the market's not determining that. The rigged market is. One that is subsidized and in which the goods and services being peddled here are underpriced in the marketplace precisely because of the policies established in their favor. Okay. Instead of a cooperative attitude in solving these global problems, we see entrenched competitive belligerence in both markets and international affairs. We don't talk in our politics any longer about moral or ethical implications, despite Peter Brown's work for decades trying to get us to open our eyes to the reality that that's what politics is really all about, isn't it? How do we express preferences? Who do those preferences affect? Well, we used to make some of those decisions based on moral and ethical considerations. However, today, short-term, self-serving uh, opportunism is the order of the day. In the mythic notion, the social construct, what it means that it's good for General Motors is good for everybody. 